Personal Ministry In the work of many ministers, there is too much sermonizing and too little real heart-to-heart work. There is need of more personal labor for souls. In Christ-like sympathy, the minister should come close to men individually and seek to awaken their interest in the great things of eternal life. Their hearts may be as hard and as the beaten highway, and apparently it may be a useless effort to present the Savior to them. But while logic may fail to move, and argument be powerless to convince, the love of Christ revealed in personal ministry may soften the stony heart so that the seed of truth can take root. Ministry means much more than sermonizing. It means earnest personal labor. The church on earth is composed of erring men and women who need patient, painstaking labor that they may be trained and disciplined to work with acceptance in this life and in the future life be crowned with glory and immortality. Pastors are needed, faithful shepherds who will not flatter God's people nor treat them harshly, but who will feed them with the bread of life. Men who in their lives feel daily the converting power of the Holy Spirit and who cherish a strong, unselfish love for those for whom they labor. There is a tactful work for the under-shepherd to do as he is called to meet alienation, bitterness, envy, and jealousy in the church, and he will need to labor in the Spirit of Christ to set things in order. Faithful warnings are to be given, sins rebuked, wrongs made right, both by the minister's work in the pulpit and by personal labor. The wayward heart may take exception to the message, and the Spirit of God be misjudged and criticized. Let him that remember that the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. James 3, 17, 18. The work of the gospel minister is to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God. Ephesians 3, 9. If one entering upon this work chooses the least self-sacrificing part, contenting himself with preaching and leaving the work of personal ministry for someone else to do, his labors will not be acceptable to God. Souls for whom Christ died are perishing for want of well-directed personal labor, and he is mistaken as calling who, having entered the ministry, is unwilling to do the personal work that the care of the flock demands. The minister must be instant in season and out of season, ready to seize and improve every opportunity to further the work of God. To be instant in season is to be alert to the privileges of the house and hour of worship and to the times when men are conversing on topics of religion. And to be instant out of season is to be ready when at the fireside, in the field, by the wayside, in the market, to turn the minds of men in a suitable manner to the great themes of the Bible, with tender, fervent spirit urging upon them the claims of God. Many, many such opportunities are allowed to slip by unimproved because men are persuaded that it is out of season. But who knows what might be the effect of a wise appeal to the conscience? It is written... In the morning sow thy seed, and in the evening withhold not thine hand. For thou knowest not whether thou shalt prosper either this or that, or whether they shall both be alike good. Ecclesiastes 11.6 He who is sowing the seeds of truth may bear a burdened heart, and at times his efforts may seem to be without result. But if he is faithful, he will see fruit of his labor. For God's word declares... He that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing, bringing his sheaves with him. Psalms 126.6 Subheading, Visiting Homes When a minister has presented the gospel message from the pulpit, his work has only begun. There is personal work for him to do. He should visit the people in their homes, talking and praying with them in earnestness and humility. There are families who will never be reached by the truths of God's word unless the stewards of his grace enter their homes and point them to the higher way. For the hearts of those who do this work must throb in unison with the heart of Christ. Much is comprehended in the command, 
Go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. Luke 14, 23. Let ministers teach the truth in families, drawing close to those for whom they labor. And as they thus cooperate with God, he will clothe them with spiritual power. Christ will guide them in their work, giving them words to speak that they will sink deep into the hearts of the listeners. It is the privilege of every minister to be able to say with Paul, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I have kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Acts 20, 27, 20, 21. Our Savior went from house to house, healing the sick, comforting the mourners, soothing the afflicted, speaking peace to the disconsolate. He took the little children in his arms and blessed them and spoke words of hope and comfort to the weary mothers. With unfeeling tenderness and gentleness, he met every form of human woe and affliction. Not for himself, but for others did he labor. He was the servant of all. It was his meat and drink to bring hope and strength to all with whom he came in contact. And as men and women listened to the truths that fell from his lips, so different from the traditions and dogmas taught by the rabbis, hope sprang up in their hearts. In his teaching, there was earnestness that sent his words home with convicting power. To my ministering brethren, I would say, by personal labor, reach the people where they are. Become acquainted with them. This work cannot be done by proxy. Money loaned or given cannot accomplish it. Sermons from the pulpit cannot do it. Teaching the scriptures and families, this is the work of an evangelist, and this work is to be united with preaching. If it is omitted, the preaching will be, to a great extent, a failure. Those who are seeking for truth need to have words spoken to them in season, for Satan is speaking to them by his temptations. If you meet with repulse when trying to help souls, heed it not. If there seems to be little good resulting from your work, do not become discouraged. Keep working. Be discreet. Know when to speak and when to keep silent. Watch for souls as they that must give an account. And watch for the device of Satan, lest you be led aside from duty. Do not allow difficulties to dishearten or intimidate you. With strong faith, with intrepid purpose, meet and overcome these difficulties. Sow the seed in faith and with an unsparing hand. Much depends upon the manner in which you meet those whom you visit. You can take hold of a person's hand in greeting in such a way as to gain his confidence at once, or in so cold a manner that he will think you have no interest in him. We should not act as if it were a condescension to come in contact with the poor. They are as precious in God's sight as we are, and we must act as if we thought them so. Our clothing should be plain and simple so that when we visit the poor, they will not be embarrassed by the contrast between our appearance and their own. The joy that comes to the poor is often very limited, and why should not God's workers carry rays of light into their homes? We need the tender sympathy of Jesus. Then we can win our way to hearts.